Yo, what's mobbing? It's your brother Zayd out the guy, Hop MC, repping that HOG, MOB, aka Young Chimney in the building. Um, I actually joined Hog Mob back in the summer of 2016, so uh, this is my fourth year in the ministry now, here in 2020. Um, and uh, it was a God sent opportunity. Uh, salute to my brother Sev and all my fellow Hog Mob ministers who have just showed me love and actually, you know, have helped me learn some things along the way uh, when it comes to using this music gift as a ministry tool. Um, and sometimes it could get twisted. Sometimes people think in career and think in money. And instead of uh, talking for Jesus, uh, we start just rapping about Jesus as an income stream. So um, I'm glad that I found Hog Mob because uh, I've learned the difference. And uh, shout out and salute to all those out here in the field who are uh, using their gifts properly for the upliftment of the people and the edifying of the body of Christ. Um, so, yeah, man, my testimony goes back, um, you know, uh, grew up in Buffalo, New York, born and raised here in upstate. Um, basically, I've uh, been rapping since I was a teen. Um, grew up. My mom was married. Uh, shout out to all my family, all my loved ones. Uh, my mom and my stepdad got divorced or separated at least when I was about 12. By the time I was 14, I believe their divorce was final. And that put a big, you know, that put a big thing in the house. And, 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 and one thing that uh, those who are in relationships, especially marriage, need to remember when you as adults walk in your errors and you make the decisions to separate and do things, children can become torn on one hand children we we love our mother and we love our father but the separation almost by default puts us in a situation sometimes to feel like we have to choose or you know make decisions that children shouldn't have to make and there's these unspoken scenarios that young men and women are put in and it's this is what's interesting because you're put in this situation in your heart, you're making decisions and starting to come to thoughts and conclusions that you never had to before. But yet no one's asking your opinion. No one is really asking you how you feel. The, 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 the parents who are traumatized are trying to hold a good face for one of the most trying times in their lives. And so they're trying to give some sense of normalcy, but that's not normal. And I know that the separation of my mother and the only man I've ever called father, it definitely did something to me, you feel me? Um, and it did something to my siblings. And so growing up, this was happening as I became an adolescent. I had to fend for myself and me not having my biological brothers in the house. You know, my biological father has sons, but I didn't grow up with them. So it was me, my mom and my sisters and my pop. And once, and once they separated, everywhere we lived in the various hoods I, I moved in, I had to learn how to become diplomatic. I had to learn how to become my own protection because I didn't have nobody to run to my defense. I had to come to a neighborhood and, and find out how to move in it, find out, you know, who's the bully. Who's the cool guy? Who's the silly guy? You know, who's the, the quiet guy? Who's the guy that's cool, but yet if you push him too far, he'll lose his temper. You know what I'm saying? Who's the scaredy cat? You know, all of these things I had to learn. And so I had to come into every neighborhood and learn to be diplomatic. And I think the kingdom of God um, was in my future. And I just didn't know it at the time. And the Lord, through his mercy, was allowing me early to learn how to have to approach people. And I think that has been something that has shaped me into my evangelist uh, slash uh, teaching and preaching role in the kingdom of God now. So uh, to move forward, um, when I was coming out of high school at about 18 years old, growing up here in the Northeast, um, there's a lot of urban ideology going on. You got the 5% nation of gods and earths. You got the nation of Islam. You got the Pan-African movement. You got the uh, Black Moors, um, the Hebrew Israelites, the various Christian, traditional Christian denominations. And um, what's another one? I'm, I'm missing. Oh, the Kemetic, you know, like the conscious cast, the woke guys who, you know, back to Egypt, we kings and queens, this, that, and the third. And I think that in that environment, um, praise God that while uh, I had the opportunity to kind of get involved in any of those because you're trying to figure out life. You in the streets, you're doing what you're doing, but yet these conversations happen in the hood all the time amongst us about what's the meaning of life and where we come from and what's our purpose. And for some reason, out of all the things I could have done, it was a small group of homies I met who always was like, yo, the true 
knowledge of God is found in the Bible. And the Bible was something like grandma and them did at church. You know, you, you got forced to go to church when you was a kid like me. Once you got old enough and your mom said you didn't have to go no more, you wasn't going. By the time I was the age 15, man, I ain't, I ain't, you know, my mom said it was up to me to go with grandma to church on Sunday. So I wasn't going. I'd rather play football. I'd rather be in the hood. Um, so that was happening in my life around the time that I was ending high school. And simultaneously, um, you know, um, when I was when I was about. 14 or 15 my mother had an accident uh she was a home care provider my mother i was a latchkey kid my mom would um make us come home from school and on certain days my mom worked we couldn't go outside we had to come home open the door lock the door don't let anybody in the house family or friend and that was just that and we went through that for a while and my mom would work them 50 60 hour a week shifts taking care of four kids by herself and in the winter one time, uh, my mom had an accident where she was getting off a bus in a blizzard and fell. And it did something internally and she was physically not able to go back to work. And so all of a sudden we got on public assistance. We started getting food stamps and things like that. And I had the mother who always did the best she could for us. And I won't say that even though we went through some traumas, my childhood was not some trash childhood. Um, because we did have extended family. We lived in neighborhoods where people, you know, you, you become very friendly. You, you grow up with them guys who are like family. You got that lady or two on the block who like a second and a third mother. And so it wasn't really that I felt poor. I felt confident growing up. But yet when those around me, when peer pressure pointed out my poverty to me, pointed out what I didn't have on my back, the, the fitted, you know, back then it was bubble gooses, starter jackets, uh, didn't have on a certain shoe. Um, that's when my vanity started to enter my mind more. And um, I got into the streets, man, when I was roughly about 17 is uh, my first um, arrest happened at 17 uh, with sweeps week in the hood. The police came through around close to Christmas time and nabbed up all the known drug dealers. You got fiends on the block who can't get no work. Me and some guys made a move to get some work in our hands and try to hit them licks all weekend until the drug dealers came back. My first time out on the block being a novice, we got ran up on by the narcos and uh, make a long story short, that was my first charge, 17 years old, um, getting caught with work, me and two of my co-Ds. And so um, I got out in the street, y'all, not because I was tough, but because I was poor. And my vanity caused me to want the things that I was picked on about not having. Um, and that got me out in the street. You feel what I'm saying? And I started moving and shaking out there. And um, as that was becoming a part of my narrative, I started to look and see the, the turmoil and the trouble in our neighborhoods. And I would always wonder, why is it like this where we at? And we could get on the highway and go take a 15 minute drive to the other side of the city. And these these are the safest places to be. Why is it like that where I'm from? And as I was asking these questions, I believe God, who knew that was in my heart and heard the cry of my heart, pointed me to his word. Um, I got my first Bible when I was 18, took me seven months to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and I started to believe what was in it. Now, that don't mean I started making great decisions, but I started to believe what was in it. And so I went through the things I went through, uh, sold a lot of drugs, got in some trouble, heavy on the fornication, heavy on the love of money, um, even committed adultery a few times, unfortunately, with women who were other men's fiancés and wives, just just evil, man. And 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 believing that because I felt I wasn't the worst person, I felt I wasn't that bad. And so I justified the things I did, the exploitation of my own community and the hurting of my own community and bringing trouble, bringing beef to the block where my mama lived. I still found some way to justify myself, but I thank God that his word was not only in my hand and I had a chance to read it, but then as years went by, I ran into older men who were able to start to put some things I was reading in the Bible in perspective. And they became like fathers to me. And I met my wife. Um, and I would say probably around the year 2001 or so, I made the decision to become baptized. Have 
so by the, by 2001, I already had a five year run, at least in reading the Bible, think I'm knowing some things. And the Lord was, you know, uh, chastising me as he do to the son who he loves. So my repentance happened, then became more consistent in church fellowship and started to do things a certain way. But the one vanity I had was, was that my my rap skill being a well-known battle rapper and a drug dealer at the same time gets you a lot of attention. And so even though I started to leave fornication by being with one woman and eventually getting married and I even stopped selling drugs. Well, I was forced to stop selling drugs because a police raid on the spot I was in put me in a position where I had enough rest that the judge uh, threatened me with a one and a third to three in state prison or to do uh, the cop out and say I was a user and they allowed me to enter a drug court program. So I entered city drug court and avoided prison time. And that was the beginning of the Lord slowly showing me you got to do something different. And as these things were happening, the one thing I could hold on to was the vanity of my music, still talking about getting money, still talking about sleeping with chicks. But yet in my regular life, that's not what I do anymore. And I do have more of an affinity for God. And so um, around 2007, I totally got away from the street music as far as glorifying the stuff in the streets. And I started to make music um, that was more or less talking about the things I had been learning over the past 10 years in God's word. And what was interesting is this, uh, y'all, I didn't know that churches allowed anyone to rap in church or anything like that. So I, since I was from the streets, the only place I knew to take rap music was to the streets. So the same clubs I did battles in, the same MC ciphers I was in blowing boys heads off and getting my head clapped at, if you will, with the lyrics. Those was the places I took these new CD recordings I was doing. And you had some people who wasn't feeling it, but you had a lot of people who was like, yo, this is dope. I ain't never heard nothing like this. And so um, that's when I officially became introduced to the idea of using the music for something different. And I would say roughly around 2009 or so, as I got introduced to this genre out here called Christian hip hop or Christian rap, gospel rap, I thought I made it up but I found out it was actually a whole world that exists doing this stuff. Um, I started to meet other Christian rappers in my city, formed some movements around, 20, er, uh, around late, no, early 2014, uh, teamed up with some people, shout out my sis AI, my homie King Shab, my man Fonz Carter, who's Meech, um, New Life, uh, my man Wills, shout out my bro, um, who else, I'm missing somebody else. Oh, shout out my homie Kyrie. Uh, we founded a movement called Rebel Against the World. We started doing CHH events in our city every 90 days, every three months. And I started to meet a lot of people in Christian rap and they didn't even know I rapped. We were just doing events, bringing Christian rap to our city, believing it was a great tool to invite the streets and the church together in one place, charging no money to get into the events, absolutely free. And we did that for about three or four years. And through those mechanisms, God introduced me to seven eventually, um, introduced me to a lot of people in Christian hip hop. And um, man, here I am today um, using my gift to edify the kingdom of God, um, to edify the body of Christ and to just encourage those who are lost in the world to give Christ a shot and not necessarily making my music a Bible sermon. But from the sermons in the Bible, God has given me the ability to take my own personal testimony, the testimony of others around me that people who are lost can identify with and then using it to show how God tediously and just, man, just awesomely transitioned us from hopeless to hope, from uh, being no good to having the potential to be good in his sight. And all of this happened in man through the auspices of his revealed son, uh, God in the flesh, uh, Jesus the Christ. And so that's my testimony. I know I could have gotten more detail, but, you know, at the end of the day, no matter how much I tell you, even if it's different from yours, if you feel that my story is lighter than yours or that it's worse than yours. All of our story got one common thread, sin. So, man, praise God. I'm thankful to God every day. You feel me? So. Just keep your eye out for me, man, because I'm out here. You feel me? <laughs> Marvin.